Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to ECE 1330. Uh, before our technical discussions today, I'd like to show one announcement uh, from the Canvas. So our TA for the ECE 3030 is being selected by the department. And our TA is Victor, and he is a PhD student with the ECE. And he will be holding the virtual office hour as shown in this 10th notes. So basically Monday to Friday, not Monday to Friday, Monday and Friday, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. with this blue jeans link. And then Tuesday and Thursday, 10.30 to 12.30 with the blue, link, blue jeans link. So if you have any questions regarding the lecture content or the questions for the upcoming homework, feel free to join one of those uh, sessions for the virtual office hour. All right, so then let's uh, get started on today's lecture. So today we are going to start our discussions on lecture three, and this is the physics of semiconductors. And in particular, we are going to discuss the bond model of the silicon material. And this is a reference chapter from the uh, recommended uh, reading material and this is chapter 1 section 1.2 from this reference book and also we have the recorded lecture from the last spring semester and also the another video from professor Asif Khan on the same topic all right so I believe that you have seen this microscopic image a couple of times so far in this course. So this is the Intel's Broadwell CPU at 14 nanometer load introduced in 2014. And this is cross-sectional view of the chip if you cut the chip into slices. And we have talked about the metal interconnect in the lecture 2. And here we are going to discuss the semiconductor substrate from today's lecture. So you know the silicon is used as a substrate material. So here the transistors are built on top of this silicon substrate. And silicon is a semiconductor material. And here the transistor structure is pretty small. And if you zoom in this transistor structure, we will see this kind of a MOSFET structure. MOSFET is short for metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. And in this particular case, this is a, a so-called FinFET MOSFET structure. This is one special type MOSFET stru structure for today's advanced technology nodes. So this is introduced by Intel at 22 nanometer load. And uh, this is like a fin of the fish. If you think about the fish is in and out of the plane. So this is like the fin of the fish. So in this uh, microscope image here on the substrate, we have this silicon. So today we are going to discuss the silicon properties in more details. If you further zoom in this image to look at this silicon fin, you will see here the atomic structure from the high resolution uh, transmission electron microscopy here. So this is uh, individual atoms actually. And uh, then here this nitro color is an interface oxide material of the silicon dioxide. And then here, this darker region is uh, another layer of the high K dielectric. And actually, I believe industry use halfing oxide, HF, sorry, HFOX. So this is the halfing dioxide. And uh, together with this silicon dioxide, we form the oxide layer. And then 
on top of this oxide layer, we have this metal gate. So here, eventually, we have the MOS structure. And this is a gate stack of today's transistor. And today, we're going to discuss the silicon substrate in great details. So far, any questions? Again, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Or if you feel more comfortable, you can type in your question from the chat box here. Any question regarding the silicon uh, substrate? All right. And uh, another note is that we have this uh, notes for each slide in this comment area. So feel free to uh, review after class. OK, so let's look at silicon. So silicon is uh, number 14 in the periodic table. So where is it? It's here. And this is uh, actually group four. So along this group four, we may have other elements like carbon and germanium and so on. So this is called group four because it has four shell electrons in the outmost orbit of those atoms. So this is group four. And silicon is the basis for today's chips and uh, no matter any circuits or digital circuit, we fabricate on top of the silicon substrate. So we need to understand better about the silicon's properties. Again, let's look at the silicon crystal structure. So this is uh, like the force representing the silicon atom. So you have seen similar crystal structure in the last lecture about copper. But the silicon's crystal structure is different from copper's silicon, uh, crystal structure. And here we still have this cube and then the lattice constant, which is the length of one side of the cube, is about 4.43 angstrom. And you know, one angstrom is uh, one tenth of the nanometer. So here is 0.543 nanometer. And uh, this silicon crystal structure actually has another name. It's the same as diamond structure. Why diamond? So if you replace the silicon atom here with carbon, you get diamond. So this is the same silicon structure as carbon structure. Sorry, diamond structure. Because carbon may have other forms. As you know, if it's a hexagonal structure, then it's more like a graphite. But if you have this kind of structure, then it's a diamond and silicon is the same as diamond. So here, if you look at each silicon atom, it will have four labeling cell. Let's say here you have four. So each silicon, as we introduced earlier, will have four shell electron. So then it will form four covalent bond with its nearest neighbors. Because each silicon can share one electron with its, its neighbor. So those two electrons will form the bond. So any questions here?
all right? So this is uh, the atomic configuration of the silicon. And you see here we have the outmost 3S and 3P orbits. And uh, here, 2 and 2. So in total, you have 4 shell electrons per silicon atom. And then the next question is, how do we make the silicon wafer out of this silicon crystal structure? Because this is a unit cell, and you have to repeat this kind of unit cell in three-dimensional space to form the silicon crystal, which may have like billions, trillions of the silicon atoms. So then if you recall the lecture at the very beginning of the semester where we show the fabrication from the sand to the chip made by Intel. So that video shows how we make the silicon wafer. And we need to cut that cylinder into this kind of wafer structure. Or oh, you can think this is a pizza, a 12-inch pizza. So the question is how do you cut along those orientations? So here, let's look at this cube in the x, y, z coordinates. So this cube, you can think is the same cube as this silicon crystal structures unit cell. Then the question is, how do you make the surface of the wafer? For example, you can cut the silicon crystal along this shaded plane. If you think this plane is the surface of this wafer, so if you cut silicon crystal along this shaded plane, then we want to make a name for this kind of orientation. So it's called 100 plane. Why is that? This is 100. So here we make some notations. The trick is that you look at the intersection between the plane and the x, y, z. So here in this case, the plane intersects with the x axis at the unit length 1. If you think this is the origin 0, then this is 1. So that's why you get here 1. And then this plane is in parallel with the y and z axis. So if it's in parallel, then we denote as zero. So this is the second zero, uh, the first zero is due to parallel with y. Oops. Parallel with y. And the second zero is because parallel with z. So this is how you get the 100. Zero, zero. You can have other orientations when you cut the wafer. For example, in the second case here, you can cut like this shaded plane. So what is the notation for this one? So you look at this one for the x-axis is in parallel because this plane is in parallel with x-axis. It does not intersect with x axis. So that means this is zero. And then this plane will intersect y at one and z at one. So this is zero, one, one. The third case here, you see that this plane intersect with x, y, z at 1, 1, 1. So this is called 1, 1, 1 plane. So this wafer surface is this 1, 0, 0 plane. This is similar as the first case. This one is more like the first case, if you think the shaded surface is the same as this one. And then if you want to make a let's say mark of the wafer, you can cut a small piece of the wafer and then you can 
make the surface perpendicular to this surface. This surface is uh, 0, 1, 1 in this particular case. So you can uh, de denote the wafer the orientations using the those two uh, symbols. Any questions here? Right? And then this image is a high resolution image under the microscope. Actually, it's under the scanning tunneling microscope. So this is to look at the individual atoms from the silicon 111 plane. So this is 111 plane. So that means what? So it's here, 111 plane. And if you have I here, you look into the 111 plane under this microscope. You will see those individual atoms like this. Okay, so the silicon crystal structure is a three-dimensional structure. And uh, in the following slides, to make it simple, we just uh, draw a two-dimensional squeezed um, network with those silicon atoms. And we call this bound model of the silicon. So here, this is just to make it simple. So we just draw a two-dimensional network. But you need to know the silicon is actually a three-dimensional structure. OK, so here we have the silicon atoms. And as we discussed before, each silicon atom is bounded with four laboring cells. And there are four covalent bonds formed between those cells. So each silicon contributes one electron with its neighbors, so they share those two electrons in this bond. And at absolute zero Kelvin temperature, so this is a, a cryogenic temperature, absolute zero Kelvin, so this is actually negative 273 degrees Celsius. So this is a, a, at absolute zero temperature, all bonds are satisfied. That means all the electrons will form those bonds in the silicon crystal. Because electrons are bonded, so they cannot move even under the electric field. So if there's no free carriers to move, so here carrier means electron, for example, then the current flow, it looks like an insulator. So that means at absolute zero temperature, silicon is like an insulator. Because all the electrons are bonded in this kind of crystal structure. And then we can consider some finite temperature. That means T larger than zero Kelvin. So at higher temperature, you know, the thermal energy may vibrate the electrons. The electrons may get enough kinetic energy to break the covalent bond. So that means here this bond may have some probability to be broken. So once the bond is broken, so then we will release, for example, here one electron here. At the same time, we will leave a vacancy of the electron behind. So this vacancy is called O. This is a new concept in the semiconductor. So this is called O. It's a vacancy. And you know, electron is negative charged. So the O will be positive charge. If we have electric field, now applied, then the electrons will move, let's say, opposite to the electric field direction. 
and hull because it's positive charge, the hull will move along the electric field. So both electron and hull can move. Then you can conduct the current, so the silicon becomes kind of conductive. So this is why it's called semiconductor. Any questions so far? I got one question. Does different orientation of the results of the cut results in different wafer properties? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, yes. So if you cut the silicon into different directions or orientations, we may have different uh, mobility as we discuss later. So the mobility, if you recall from the lecture two, is uh, a co coefficient between the velocity of the electron versus the electric field. So basically the mobility is how fast the electron can move under the electric field. And if you cut the silicon wafers into different orientation, then for the traveling and let's say for the traveling direction, the electrons may see different kind of atomic uh, structure. For example, you think about this, the electrons will travel through if you apply electric field this way. So electrons will travel through and then it will be bounced back by those atoms, right? So we call this scattering. And uh, depending on how you cut, then along this traveling direction, the electrons may see different kinds of, uh, let's say, a, a scattering uh, and profile from the atomic structure. So the mobility will be different. This mu will be different. And in the industry, I believe that for the most of the wafers, we use this 100 zero zero plan because the mobility of the electron is, is larger in this case. All right. I got another question. Is the hole essentially just an absence of a negative charge, or does it actually carry a positive charge? So I think the, those two interpretation is actually the same thing, right? So the hole is absence of the electron. Because electron is negative charge, so hole will be positive charge. Because before you create the electron and the hole pair, the system is charge neutral, right? If you create this free electron, then you will have the positive charge hole because you need to maintain the system to be charge neutral. So once you create a pair of electron and hole, then electron negative charge, hole positive charge. So you can think this is the uh, absence of the electron, that's true, or vacancy of the electron. And because the electron is negative charge, so hole is positive charge. All right, any other questions before we move on? Okay, so here I think uh, the animations will show the electron flow and the hole flow actually are equivalent. For example, right now this is the let's say, configuration of the electron and holes uh, in the system. And then if you think about the electric field applied, so the electrons tend to move to the right. So for example, this electron here will move to the right. And now those electron and hole are, let's say, at the same location. So they may have the probability to recombine. That means we are going to reform the bond here. As a result, those two, let's say, electron and hole will 
be disappeared. So this is called recombination. And after that, then they are gone. But actually, you can think that the hole is moving to here. If the hole originally is here because of recombination, then the hole disappears at this location, but the hole will show up in this location. So it's like exchanging the location of the electron the hole. Or in other words, electrons move to the right and hole to move to the left. So this is uh, uh, the equivalence between the electron current and hole current. So here we have this uh, conclusion. For all practical purpose, it is easy to consider holes as equivalent to electrons with positive charge. So I think the take home message is uh, you just think the hole is uh, opposite to electron. And uh, if electron can move, then hole can move, but to the opposite direction under the electric field. So those electrons which can be moved is called free electron. So this is different from those electrons those uh, bonded with the atom. So here we care about the electrons that can be moved. We call it free electron. And this is what we care about in the following discussions, or let's say through the semester. We only care about the free electron in this course, because those electrons are bonded with the let's say with the atoms and does not contribute to the current. So here we only consider the free electron. Any questions? All right, let me stop uh, recording and break up into two parts of today's lecture.